Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this uh, SIMM webinar, uh, which is going to be given today by Mr. Milan Swat. Uh, Milan is a bursar with uh, Mintech and Prima. Uh, he's doing a lot of work in examining the behavior of uh, dust dispersion around metallurgical plants and its impact on the future applications of uh, solar energy uh, based technologies around those plants. Um, Milan is busy completing his master's study at the University of Pretoria under Professor Ken Craig, and he is getting ready to submit fairly shortly. So uh, today his presentation is going to be summar summarizing a lot of his work in the soiling effects of dust around metallurgical plants, uh, and it should be extremely interesting. So Milan, as soon as you're ready, you can go for it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Quinn. Uh, let me just share my screen. Get a pointer going. All right. Is that uh, fine? Fine for everyone? Yeah, it looks good. Perfect. So I titled my talk today. Um, it's called Solar Reflector Soiling in the Vicinity of a Ferromanganese Smelter, uh, Results from Experimental and Computational Fluid Dynamics Based Investigations. So just a bit of background about me, as Quinn said, I'm a master's student at the University of Pretoria and I am a bursar at Mintech and uh, the funding is provided by the Prima Project, which is what I'll be focusing on today. So first of all, sorry, the slide didn't want to change. The inspiration from the project came from uh, many places in the world where there's an abundant mineral res resource as well as an abundant solar resource. And the idea is to combine these two to reduce the emissions of the smelting process. So the Prima project was conceived from that idea and uh, the Prima stands for energy efficient primary production of manganese ferro alloys through the application of novel energy systems in the drying and preheating of furnace feed materials. So the Prima project proposes to split the traditional submerged arc furnace smelting process for manganese ferro alloys into a two step process introducing pre-treatment stages to the process and there's various technologies being investigated and the one that I'll focus on today is the solar thermal pre-treatment aspect. So just to give an overview of this diagram is the, the ores are preheated before they go up until 600 degrees celsius before they enter the smelter and that's what actually results in the energy savings. So the concept is to integrate a concentrating solar thermal type plant with the smelting process. And the, an overview of the, of the CST plant process is solar reflectors that focus the sun's rays onto a central point. And in this case, we are using particle technology because it's got good heat storage properties to transfer the heat and then store it to create a thermal buffer so that continuous operations are possible. And then exchange the heat from the particles with air and then exchange again the heated air with the ores in the furnace. So there's a, there's a performance, there's a various aspects that impact the performance of CS plant technologies. And a major one is the soiling of the mirrors or the heliostats, as they are called. And on this image, I try to show some dust collected on this mirror. I hope everyone can see that. And some facets are cleaner than others. And this, this, this causes beam deflection and all sorts of issues, resulting in major performance losses of the plant which impacts the economic feasibility of the operation. 
So CSP plants are typically situated in desert environments where there is an abundant solar resource. And this is typically also can be characterized as a regional dust source. So you can't pinpoint where the dust comes from. It just comes from the, the desert surface in the region. So for, the, for my aspect that I'm investigating for the Prima project, is to look at how does soiling impact these mirrors in the vicinity of an industrial dust source, namely a ferromanganese smelter in this case. Uh, this is novel research. Uh, usually soiling research is done in these desert type locations where there's typically only one type of dust. So we had a few questions and one of them was, can we prevent soiling as much as possible in the vicinity of a smelter? Can we mitigate soiling? And is it feasible? As I mentioned, the dust impacts the reflective performance of the mirrors. So you can see the solar rays coming in and it gets shaded and blocked. So there's a double, there's a double effect that occurs and that's why the dust settling onto these mirrors is so potent. We first just did a bit of a literature survey to see where can we expect dust to come from at a ferromanganese smelter and 34% is attributed, loosely attributed to materials handling, 30% from furnace emissions, 13% from tapping emissions, 8% general and the rest from center production and fugitive dust. Also, we just looked at what is average ref acceptable reflectance losses per day and at what point do, do the reflectors need to be cleaned? Now, this, this is a very site specific um, number and it depends on the soiling rates at that specific site. But if we take, if we take an, an average reflectant acceptable reflectance loss of 0.8% per day, we can go about two weeks before we need to clean. If we accept that any reflectance below 80%, the mirrors need to be cleaned. We conducted our experimental work at Trans Alloys in Emalathleni in South Africa, which is in the heart of the industrial region region. Um, there's many coal fields found here and power plants and heavy, in, heavy energy intensive industries naturally also are located here because of the coal resource and the closeness to power plants. This is just another view to show where mining activities take place in the region with trans alloys in the center with also a lot of agricultural lands in the surrounding area. So this is really an ideal place, a very dusty place, and therefore ideal to be doing these kinds of soiling studies. An overview of the experimental setup. Uh, this is a close-up view of the trans alloy smelter. And what we did is we had four sampling set or four dust sampling locations located at around the plant at various locations, S1, S2, S3, S4. And we also had a supplemental weather station with a wind mast, uh, wind, wind vane at 11 meters above the ground, measured rainfall as well, on-site rainfall, as well as the solar radiation. And this was all published, uh, this is all published in an open access database and we had a standalone wind mast in an open field as well that measures the wind velocity and direction at two different heights above ground, four meters above ground and 10 meters above ground. And we'll see later why, why this is needed. And these are the dust deposition and mirror swelling sampling setups. This is how they look. Each one, each sampling location consists of eight mirrors and a few dust buckets 
that capture the deposits of dust settling out of the atmosphere. So firstly, firstly, we just tried to get a general feel for the conditions at site, took a bunch of grab samples from different locations uh, to see what kinds of dust we can expect at the plant. And as you can see, there are various dusts, various minerals that we found, iron oxide, silico manganese, carbon, baghouse dust, which is a mixture of the first three, manganese ore dust and quartz dust, and also the local red sand. So there's many different kinds of dust that we can expect to find on the site. And if we just think back to compare this back to a typical CSP plant, which is in a desert environment where you'll probably only find one main type of mineral, maybe two. Um, so this, this is a completely different picture and that is why we need to do some tests. As I said, just to get a general feel, we looked at some historical data uh, made available by Trans Alloys. They do dust monitoring, dustfall monitoring at various locations around the plant. And these are the different locations, not previously labeled. So this is just, uh, I labeled them in an arbitrary manner, just to show that there is um, a seasonal variation in dustfall, dust deposition rates and um, that which corresponds to the South African, South African winter and dry period sees more dust fall than when the, rain, when the rains are falling in the summer, South African summer period. We also looked at the dust sampled from the mirrors as well as the total atmospheric dust collected from the dust buckets. And we observed an interesting we found an interesting um, particle size distributions. Taking a closer look, we can see that the, the, the particle size distribution of the dust that is found on the mirrors is much focused on the smaller end of the spectrum uh, in comparison to what is actually in the atmosphere. And this is because larger particles tend to fall off of the mirrors. And this is, this is, this matches what, what we saw in literature. And it's, it's an important result because larger particles, they tend to uh, spread less, but if they do get trapped on your mirror, they have a disproportionate impact because of their larger cross-sectional area. We also looked at um, the, the morph morphology of the dust particles sampled from the mirrors. And just to show the, the, just to say the agglomeration seen in these uh, same micrograph photos is a result from the sampling process and not because not, not, not as a result of how they settle on the mirrors. Looking at the particles, they have jagged edges or they have, they have rough edges, but they can't be considered jagged. So this is important because when you clean the mirrors, you don't want jagged particles that can abrade the mirror surface and therefore degrade the reflective performance. We also did XRD analysis to see what different phases are present in the mirror sample and also just to confirm whether the dust is in fact coming from the smelter or is it coming from the area because as mentioned there are many different um, plants in the area but with our analysis we could actually confirm that the dominant phases are from the plant namely the silica oxide the guyanite the, the aluminium ions silicon which um, the aluminium stems from coal the coal reserves as well as the ores and a high concentration of which is present in the ash from the from the furnace products and the silica oxide comes from the raw quartz piles and some of the regional dust. So these results confirm that the main dust source is in fact the smelter and it can be considered as a point source. Also looking at the atmospheric condition of the smelter area, uh, 
over a period of time, we had it available to us historical data as well. So we combined historical data with uh, on-site measured data from the weather station. And once again, there's a, yeah, we can maybe more clearly see the seasonal trend that that emerged. Uh, very, very dry season, no rain in the winter period in, the South, in, in South Africa, where we are located. And quite a bit of rain during the summer season. And we expect this to have an impact on the reflectance measurements. So going on from here, I will only talk about re results we measured and measurements we made in the driest period that we observed. Um, because that, that is where, where we want to focus our efforts, where the most soiling is experienced. This is data from the standalone wind mast at 10 meters height uh, with each of these wind roses corresponding to a mirror sampling period, thus a reflectance sampling period. And the wind rose basically just indicates direction and speed um, occurrences. To take the reflectance measurements from the mirror samples, we used a camera-based reflectometer loaned to us by the CSIR. The camera is able to take high resolution images, which is important be because of the way that we process these afterwards to determine the reflectance. The a single sampling session results in around 1,400 images. And we, that, that comes from about 40 photos per mirror. And so the, the procedure, the analysis procedure that we used is to take, as mentioned, about 40 photos from at various locations on the mirror surface. And this is the result uh, of a soiled image. And this is the result of a cleaned image. And then what we do is we look at the mean pixel intensity on these images and we take the soiled Every, the soiled mean pixel intensity as a percentage of the clean, clean mirrors pixel intensity. And we use that to derive reflectance since it's just a, a fraction of what's coming in versus what's coming out. Light coming in, light coming out. So this is what we end up with for an eight month sampling period the reflectance data starting at one, a clean, all, all of the mirrors cleaned, looking at sampling set locations, one, two, three, and four at various locations around the plant. And as time progresses, the mirrors soil, 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 and then we sample them, they, they clean, they are cleaned and sampled again. And then they are left to soil again. And so it goes. And there was also a smelter shutdown period at some point during the sampling. And we can see it doesn't really impact the soiling trends, the reflectance trends as much as expected. And this, this leads us to our hypothesis that all of the dust produced on site settles out and builds up in a kind of dust reservoir that then gets blown around by the wind so it doesn't actually matter if if the plant's been operating for a period of time there will be enough dust in the plant area to be dispersed even if the plant isn't operational so this was quite an important finding uh, that we made with these measurements and you can see there's a bunch of different soiling rates occurring at the different locations and maybe this this trend shows it a bit better so this is the reflectance data converted to mean reflectance loss rates to be able to more clearly see the trends. And we can see there's a trend that emerges that the soiling in sampling set three is a bit of an outlier. It's always, it's always uh, experiencing higher soiling rates than the other three locations. And we attributed this to proximity as set three is located very close to raw materials piles and in fact located the closest to the smelter to the smelters 
but once again we can see there's a there's a variation in soiling depending on the relative location of these sampling sets and this is just a result this is just an 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 average from literature of what's what's an acceptable soiling rate and what isn't so basically what we saw is in the winter months in the dry months where there's lots of dust we see unacceptable soiling rates But in the summer months, we actually see acceptable soiling rates. But then there's a trade-off because that is because there's rainfall and less solar radiation. These are just two close-ups close to show the difference between the two seasons and how an extremely soiled mirror sample looks versus a relatively, relatively clean, cleaner mirror sample but still soiled so to summarize the experimental results what we found was clear seasonal mirror soiling and dust fallout trends we also saw that there's a positional dependence relative to the plant so depending on where you are you will experience different soiling rates the sampling set three was consistently soiled the worst and we attributed this to proximity. So proximity is the main driver of soiling. And we did observe acceptable soiling rates in the rainy season. So just purely based on the experimental campaign, we can say that it, see, it, it, it is feasible to locate mirrors in the vicinity of a smelter, but some interventions will be needed, especially for the dry period when most soiling is expected. So the second part of our investigations was a computational fluid dynamics based investigation, numerical investigations. Why do we need this? Well, the questions we asked was, can a CFD based investigation assist with site selection? of a CS plant close to a point dust source of a smelter. Why do we want to do this? Because experimental campaigning might be too time consuming or costly. And in this case, our experimental campaign took around about a year with all the planning and all of that. And it can also be costly. Also, especially if there isn't an existing plant to conduct experimental work with then you are in the dark so maybe we need a predictive tool a predictive capability for when experimental work isn't a possibility so why cfd well cfd is a general physics simulation tool and it gives a complete picture of the flow field so it's not it's not it's not an empirical based modeling system it's a general modeling system that reproduces physics so to do cft we need to first get a computational domain going and for that we need an accurate representation of the terrain we obtained a two meter accurate representation of the terrain as is seen in this image and you can see the slag heaps are clearly visible and there's the trans alloys slag heap right there in the center. And the characteristic length of the largest part of the slag heap is about 460 meters in length. So that just gives us an idea of scale. And the domain we settled on after some sensitivity testing was a domain with a five kilometer extents upstream and on either side of the of the area of interest, which is the trans alloys smelter complex. So a 10 by 10 kilometer domain size. The other aspect that we need is a good representation of the smelter buildings. From this, we took the more detailed CAD representation of the, of the smelter building complex and simplified it to get a bluff bluff body going 
and we added some other storage buildings that aren't visible in in this more detailed CAD view. And this will have the same effects on the flow field as the more detailed view, except with a, with a lower computational cost as we aren't interested in exactly what is happening at the buildings and when the flow separates, we aren't interested in that. We are just interested in the bulk effects that the building causes on the flow. So once we have the terrain and we have the buildings, we can generate the computational domain. And what you see here is that 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer size domain, and it is one kilometer in height, centered on trans alloys. And these are the elements that are used for the computation. And as you can see, they get smaller and smaller as we get closer and closer to the area of interest to provide a better resolution of what is happening with the flow field. Just to give an idea of scale, these cells that you see on the terrain wall are 16 meters in size, shrinking to about one meter on the building faces. So we get, we get a good detail of what's happening in the region of the buildings and then in the slag heap area. And this computational domain is able to capture a large size range of flow effects as mentioned from one, one, about one meter to, to anything up to 160 meters in size. This is a cross-sectional view of the generated mesh containing about 14 million polyhedral cells. And here again, you can see as we get closer and closer to the, to the area of interest where we are interested in what's happening to the dust, the detail and of the cells, the, the size of the cells are smaller to capture the flow details better. So to produce a trustworthy simulation, we need a bit of trustworthy data and we need reasonable inputs. So we use the wind mast, the standalone wind mast, 10 meters height above ground data to derive, to derive boundary conditions from. And we also use the 10 meter height above ground data to, as validation for the flow field that the CFT produces. And we focused on this Combined wind roast for the period of interest is for that dry season that I mentioned. This is the combined wind roast frequency of occurrence for direction and speed, wind speed. And we settled on the dominant wind direction as the validation test case, which is the south-southwest wind direction. And taking a look at the sampled data over a period of an hour at two different locations, just to see why we can't use, for instance, for a given south-southwest wind direction, why we cannot make use of the wind mast provided with a weather station is because with the dominant wind of south-southwest, it's actually situated behind the slag heap. So there is a, a fluctuation in direction of the wind in that location in comparison to the stable, most, much more stable wind direction measured at the standalone wind mast location. So that's why we use the standalone wind mast for our validation and derivation of our input. Now, as you can also see, the wind rows is split into different bins for wind speed, going from lowest to highest. And this typically follows a Weibull distribution with the lowest wind speeds occurring the most, about 70% of the time, and the higher wind speeds, higher than about six meters per second, only about 30% or less of the time. So instead of simulating each direction, we chose to split, to split this distribution up into two speeds, two reference speeds, 
three meters per second and six meters per second. Remember at 10 meters height above ground. And this is also based on dust erosion models to see at what speeds do different dust particles get picked up and trained and dispersed. So a low wind speed will tend to disperse less particles and a higher wind speed will tend to disperse more particles. So on the left hand side, two blocks here, we can see the derived input inlet, condition, inlet boundary conditions for the CFD, which is these analytic profiles. And we derive that from the wind mast data, but this is actually not correct. The wind mast is the only data we have. So this is the best choice we can make, but ideally we would have a wind mast located at the boundary condition of the computational domain because the wind profiles develop as the, as the flow progresses. But this is the best we can do. So we derive input conditions for the CFD. We plug that into the simulation and then we measure the profiles of velocity and turbulent kinetic energy at the wind mass location to see are, the, are they maintained, what happens to them, do they degrade. And if we look at them, we can see that the velocity boundary layer profile speeds up a bit. And this is to, due to an increase in height of the terrain and it also just naturally occurs in in CFD simulations as well as it's accompanied by a degradation of the turbulence kinetic energy profile but it's still within an acceptable range so we can trust the result that it produces and I should say this is for the reference height of six meters per second at 10 meters above ground. And then we end up with results for the flow field. And this is for a south southwest direction for the six meters per second reference velocity case. You can see the velocity field here at 10 meters height above ground. And looking at the six meters per second boundary condition prescribed at the inlets, which is this face and this face, quickly develop and change speed. And in this case, as the wind flows here in line with the wind mast, it increases in velocity. And about there where the wind mast is, there is a, an increase in velocity seen. So we can see how the wind speed actually increases, but then at the outlet of the domain on the, on the Eastern and Northern face, the velocity is recovered again. Here's a, here's a slice of the velocity, streamwise velocity, as it flows over the plant area, region of interest, going over the buildings. And this is, this is an averaged result from the CFD. We aren't doing transient simulations. So this is an, uh, an averaged result of what is happening with the flow. And here you can see the boundary layer, the atmospheric boundary layer going over the buildings and the slag heap and the effects, the velocity slowdowns and possible recirculation that's happening in the wake regions. And this will all have an effect on the dust dispersion. Here is just another view of the, of the flow field, looking at the turbulent kinetic energy, which will have an, an effect on the dust dispersion. And we can see that in the immediate region of the buildings, the turbulent kinetic energy is increased a lot and then there's a wake region where it, the flow recovers again. Now that we have the CFD flow field results, we can go on to look at the particle dispersion. So this slide is quite busy. I'll do my best to make things clear here. So the method used for simulating the dust dispersion is called the discrete phase method or DPM, which is, which is a Lagrangian based method that tracks uh, a discrete element in a 
finite volume flow field, different frame of reference. And the method used is stochastic, which means that there are random perturbations imparted on the particles as they flow. And so, so to get a, an accurate representation of what, a, a good enough statistical representation of what's happening to the dispersion, many simulations need to be run. So for in this case, 128,000 injections were needed, which equates to about 64 million particles tracked, and that produces uh, an averaged, averaged particle size distribution results equatable to the data that we measured on site of the particle size distribution. So I created a dummy dummy injections to release particles from and to see how the particles travel downstream. And we've got two different injections here just to show the difference that the turbulence and the effects of, of the buildings have on the flow and the particles dispersion. And we can see that releasing particles in the free stream area, undisturbed area of the flow, it, they take much longer to spread, but eventually they do reach the same, about the same plume width. So turbulence causes faster dispersion, which is naturally expected. We placed two different, in the CFD, two different samplers downstream of injection two to see how the dust just sample dust distribution varies with distance downstream. And these samplers surfaces placed in, this, in the simulation was 20 by 20 meters in size it's to catch more particles. If they were made smaller, more, more simulations will be needed. So the level of accuracy that we can get out of these simulations are 20 by 20 meters. Otherwise, more injections will be needed. To validate the results, we looked at the this particle size distribution sampled at those two locations downstream for the various different reference wind velocities six meters and three meters per second. And we can see with a slower wind speed, only the very tiny particles end up at the sampler. And as expected, going further downstream, the, the distribution skews to the smaller side. Looking at the higher, higher reference velocity, um, a more spread out particle size distribution is found with the same trend going further downstream. Now to validate, we compared this six meter per second case, particle size distribution with the measured particle size distributions. And just to summarize the, the input that we used for the injection was based on the total atmospheric dust particle size distribution and the, the, the particle size distribution that we measured at the sampler surfaces matched this red line, which close, closely matches the, the measured particle size distributions from the mirror samplers on site. So this shows us that the, the dispersion results are believable. They produce results within the range of what we sampled on site. And they are usable for, for the case that we are interested in, which is mirror soiling. So this is the final result that I'd like to show today. And what we see here is the test sampling test case, which is a given period that, that experienced the worst soiling 
and this corresponds to once again the the worst soiling period and looking at the cfd results we did the dispersion for high and low speeds with a dust source centered in the middle of trans alloys the reservoir source and looked at the dispersion results we weighted them with the frequencies of occurrence of the top seven occurring wind directions and this is the result that we ended up with a weighted dispersion result and we can see uh, i just drew a contour here to indicate it's an arbitrary contour just to indicate the shape of the dispersion here and if we compare the dispersion pattern with what we sampled on site for this period the order of soiling from most soiled to least soiled matches what the cfd particle dispersion result produced namely sampling set three experienced the most soiling followed by sampling set one followed by sampling set two and then sampling set four so you can imagine if you are now considering to place a concentrating solar thermal plant in the vicinity of a smelter which is a cut out petty in the middle just to enhance the contrast of the dispersion result you'd want to place this this the concentrating solar plant not too close because it will experience a lot of soiling but also not too far because otherwise the heat transfer will become too costly and experience too many losses so if if you only considered the this month or this sampling period it's wind data you'd want to locate your concentrating solar plant somewhere on this side of the smelter but naturally this will not be the case you'll have a more composite windrows representing maybe one year or two years and then it is possible to use that to predict where more soiling will occur and where less soiling will occur So what did we find from the CFD investigation? CFD is able to accurately reproduce the wind flow field for neutral atmospheric conditions. And CFD coupled with the, with the discrete phase method can be used to predict dispersion. And this can then be used to assist with site selection of a concentrating solar plant in the vicinity of a smelter. So to summarize, apologies, duplicate slide. That's it. These are the project Prima project partners that all form a part of the consortium. Thank you. Any questions? I'm happy to answer. Great. Thank you very much, Milan. An extremely interesting presentation and a very in-depth tour through just getting on mirrors, <laughs> which is, I'm not sure when any of us started studying metallurgy, we thought we'd have to think about this stuff, but there you are, it's a new world. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, just write them in the Q&A, if so. I don't see any questions at the moment, but maybe while everybody else is typing, I can ask one or two. Um, Milan, just one question. Uh, so based on your the, that overall dispersion pattern that you're seeing, or dust deposition pattern that you're seeing, I mean, I guess in that particular case, it's pretty much just directly corresponding to the windrows, right? If you know the windrows, you pretty much know where the dust is going to end up. Um, yes. so, so I guess in, in, in locations where you have a very dominant prevailing wind direction, it's probably a bit debatable whether you need this kind of analysis. But yeah. I guess where, where you have a much more evenly, evenly dispersed wind rows, it would be a lot more valuable. Yes, yes. So that, that is a valid point. Um, if there's a dominant wind direction, 
then you can you can make a best case as to where the dust will end up because there's a cause a clear cause and effect relationship between where the wind's blowing and where the dust is going. Mm. The reason why this is interesting is because there are local obstacles, namely a slag heap and the buildings themselves. Mm. So that, that makes it a bit more interesting. Um, but, uh, and we do see various wind directions and speeds. So that, that's what makes, makes it a tool like this more useful. Mm, definitely. Yeah. And, and as you say, maybe in places where you've got a much more sort of uniform wind rows, then there's not going to yeah. be an obvious direction or so, side of the plant to place the thing. Yeah, okay. it, very, it, very won't, it won't be so obvious. And then it'll depend on exactly where your sources are and exactly right. where where the local obstacles are placed. Mm, okay, cool. Um, still no questions from anybody else. So maybe I can just ask one more. Um, on the, the validation against the DPM tests, uh, I was just wondering how sensitive was that to the, the physical properties that you assume for the particles in terms of the densities and the, obviously this, the, you know, the, the other properties like that and the drag, the drag functions and things like that. Mm. Could you make so, some comments? Um, yeah. So, so I assumed, I assumed spherical particles with uh, standard spherical drag laws, particle density does have an effect. Um, so that, that becomes a more complicated thing to simulate if you want to reproduce exactly the the particles composite particle size distributions based on sampling done on site mm -hmm. it becomes much more complicated to feed in different particle types and then to represent those in a in a complete distribution it'll mm -hmm. just be much more costly it is possible mm -hmm. um, but yeah it, it is more dense particles settle out sooner mm -hmm less dense particles travel further and that mm. that's also that that's also as expected but mm. i did do some um, sensitivity tests and the particle density that i used was actually for the silica oxide which was the most common phase that we found in our samples right okay cool okay we've got a question from lena hockaday uh Milana, I imagine that this type of study has other applications in environmental control. Will the study lead to any further research? So, yes, thanks, Lina. And thanks for joining from Oz. I appreciate that. Um, yes, it can easily be used to, let's say, not necessarily see where do you want to locate a concentrating solar plant, but maybe where do you want to locate a photovoltaic plant because they also suffer from swelling losses just not as much from not just not as much as a concentrating solar plant it can also be used to see maybe where um, fugitive emissions will end up or t will tend to end up and to maybe see how communities could be impacted by that um, so yes there's definitely as mentioned, it's it's a general uh, CFD is a general tool that's not specific to any location. So that's what makes it great is you can apply it, um, but specifically for the dispersion, yes, there, there's definitely other applications. Maybe for your PhD, Milan. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. If there's, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. I think you've uh, you've given everybody. The information they need oh wait we've got one more from adrian barnard uh he asks could day night or winter summer temperatures variations have any impact on the dust collection yes thanks adrian for sure um so the sampling that we did is a more cumulative sample because we mostly did sampling every two weeks so whatever we sample is a result of two weeks worth of soiling but there's definitely temperature and humidity effects on the soiling. For instance, um, humid periods during the early morning hours combined with um, higher concentrations of dust in the atmosphere can actually lead to increased soiling on the mirrors. It can cause all sorts of local effects on the mirrors like cementation of the particles. So the local atmosphere definitely has an effect on how are you going to deal with the dust and what what interventions are you going to use 
Yeah, oh, okay. I, I, and I, I guess also it's uh, that's going to be a lot more strongly linked to sort of how the dust sticks to the mirrors rather than necessarily how it gets there in the first place, right? Yeah. So yeah. So maybe I, I didn't answer that part. Is how does it affect the dispersion of dust? So I, I only looked at a neutral atmosphere, which um, doesn't include turbulent mixing from rising rising um, air columns, and yeah, that definitely has an effect on dispersion. Uh, an unstable atmosphere leads to more dispersion and dust particles traveling further downstream. And a stable atmosphere has the opposite effect. So a neutral, a neutral, at, neutrally buoyant atmosphere is in the middle of those two. So it, it's it's a good, it gives a good idea. Like um, as like I said, this the idea isn't to exactly reproduce what is happening on site, like maybe a meteorological model might want to do, like WARF, where they want to predict exactly what's what is happening. This is just more to see what are the trends what, based on the physics. Great. Thanks, Milan. Um, I think if we don't have any more questions, uh, we can probably thank Milan once more. Uh, we're almost exactly on time. So thank you, Milan, for the length of your presentation. It was well-timed. Uh, extremely interesting work. And we look forward to seeing how this goes as the the pyrometallurgy sector starts to green up and go for renewables. It's going to be yeah. a lot more interesting problems we have to consider. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much to SIMM for hosting um, and for all the attendees that took the time out to come along and listen. Thank you very, very much. Um, if you are, yeah, if you're interested in any more of the work that Milan has been doing, I think you can definitely contact, uh, contact him through uh, Nasli and SIMM, um, we can also, or if you know me, you can contact me directly and we can chat further. But otherwise, uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you very much again for your time and uh, we'll see you all soon. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.